Yeah, so I, uh, we have a mid-sized firm. We have 32 people based in Boston. And um, I wanted to just talk about the last three years. It's been a very strange time for all of us. And to talk about what it's meant for us as a studio and what the kind of the foundations of, of our studio, the ethics of our studio, and how that the pandemic has actually coalesced a lot of the, um, the, the often kind of disparate um, interests that we have in the office. Um, this is my first in-person lecture in the last two and a half years. And i um, very happy to be here. I also want to just acknowledge that a lot of the work that you're going to see today um, is uh, many thanks to Karen and Christopher for uh, kind of channeling students to join us. Um, they are, we have a very collaborative office, and um, they are uh, they were and are an uh, important part of, of the studio. So public health, you know, it's something that is so uh, at the forefront of our discussion these days. Um, Fifteen years ago, there was a client in Chicago who saw something in our work, both in the work that we did as uh, public artists and our work as landscape architects in kind of underserved neighborhoods, um, who said, well, we have a healing garden at the Crown Sky Garden. And we, we need unconventional solutions. And so um, that was our first healthcare project. And what we learned through that early dialogue about the toolkit of nature in the kind of process of healing is that, um, first of all, it's really rewarding work. I mean, you, it's the opposite, uh, sorry to everybody, it's, uh, it's the opposite of residential work. You, you go in and you are uh, working with the most fragile population in America. They are in pediatrics, they are groups of people who really need your help and it, it just, makes you feel as a landscape architect that you are actually making a difference, which we all want to do, right? We all, we all want to say that what we're doing is actually making the world a better place to live, right? You know, that sounds like a tagline for Nike or something, but that is really the kind of ethical practice that we are trying to build. And, um, and so, you know, there, there's something about the work that, um, and so we have tried to inhabit the space or create the space. And what I want to do tonight is to um, kind of challenge the notion of resiliency and widen the room a little bit. Because I think sometimes, and I'm not saying you guys do this, but sometimes there is an assumption that if you just manage ecological resiliency, the other stuff will take care of itself. And that is absolutely, absolutely untrue. Um, we all inhabit um, our bodies, and we know how complex we are as human beings. This is a map, a uh, flood, global flood map, and basically is a map of where we work. So I am really interested in, in, uh, in kind of stormwater and water and the urban setting. We also know as human beings that we are living in more and more of a fragile world. Um, even though we are so dependent on the systems that we are starting to destroy. And so you just read the paper this morning and you can see these kind of storm surges, the kind of the pressing issues, environmental issues. And our office really focuses on water as an issue that is tied to making our lives more livable. And so it's in that space that we find social justice. When you multitask, what I mean by that is when you think of at the same time what the human impact is and the environmental impact on the designs that you make. 
you do it at the same time. Now, maybe not exactly at the same time. Like maybe at 10 a.m., you start to think of what that multisensory experience is. And at 11 a.m., you collect um, some ish, uh, uh, volumes of civil engineering water. And then at noon, it's a kind of evolving uh, an iterative process. And so that is the place where when, when those two conditions overlap, is when we start to bring social equity. Now, equity is the wrong word. I, I don't know if equity is achievable, actually, but social justice. And so for me, it's, a, it's not just a tagline. It's not just something four or five years ago that, we all, that I went out and chanted about in the streets because there, we were not treating each other well, right? But it's a deeply personal. Um, it's a deeply personal matter. I am a typical American story. I was born and raised on the East Coast to um, immigrant parents who came here from South Korea to make a better life for their children. And um, there were many times when I grew up in a very monochromatic society that I felt almost invisible. And I think it was great training to be a design, a civic designer, because it taught me to really care about the voiceless, because it was me. It wasn't some abstract idea. And I think we all, I look around the room, and there's many colors. Um, I think we all have that inside of us. We all have parts of our, ourselves that are not heard, are not seen. And I think that is an important part of being a landscape architect, is to bring together a sense of community. You're trying to build a neighborhood. And it's not just um, the people in the center, but to understand everybody and to try to bring them into the fold. But I talked about water, and it is the primary reason people call us, besides the public health piece. I am really f frightened and fascinated by the way the, the, the globe, global environment is changing. And we, we really try in every project to use a myriad of technologies and to use the latest technologies, both old and new, natural and technological, to kind of try to transform and ameliorate these conditions. I think that, um, and so that's the foundation. I'm sorry to tell you this, that's the baseline. And then you are designers. And it is really important, at least for me, to say now it's time to bring a sense of wonder and to, bring, to spark the imagination, to bring a sense of culture. And so what does that mean, you know, with uh, with water, what's so amazing about water is, and scary, is that you know, it, 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 it transforms every day, every minute. And that is a design kind of foundation. And you can do a lot of different, it has many phases. So why not, right? Why not use your imagination as designers to create places that take, this is a project I'm not talking about today, but t that um, take places, uh, take con conditions of stormwater, and then aerate it, and cool the environment, and then create a sense of wonder, right? That's what I call multitasking. Um, so what do I mean by create a sense of wonder? Because I'm trying today, I feel like we use words carelessly these days, social justice equality, green infrastructure. And I, I want for all of us to be more specific when we use language, because it's so important. Because people believe us when we say things. And often, they understand our words more than they understand the things we make, until they're built. But um, I have a deep love of music. I had trained to be a pianist until I 
was in my third year of conservatory, and um, maybe this is why I'm interested in kind of a restorative condition, because I had developed a, kind of a sports injury, and I had to stop altogether. And it was a traumatic moment. Um, but I, I am so grateful that I have a really deep understanding of music. I don't just enjoy it but it's a language that I understand very deeply. So when I hear something, I actually, it's like another language. And um, I've been thinking, you know, in design, it's not the topic of today's um, lecture, but I am very interested in the body as a whole, not just the visual, which is, I think, often a very Western point of view about how you design landscapes, but a multi-sensory, Landscape is such an amazing tool because you can hear it, you smell it, it transforms over the seasons. And if you don't pay attention to that, you really miss out. And so, um, but the, the thing about, um, about sound, like what is the difference between sounds and music that moves you? Right, like what's the difference between a truck backing up and beeping, and I don't know, Bob Dylan. Actually, I, I've gotten in trouble with that because Bob Dylan doesn't move me. But, so I've had in a lecture, I've had somebody ask me, like, what's your favorite Bob Dylan song? And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. Um, let's see, like um, the Goldberg Variations by Glenn Gould, or anything Bill Evans performs. Um, Lady Gaga, I love her, she's amazing. It is this place, ooh, it doesn't show up. It's this place. So, so there are molecules knocking around all of us right now, and it's not until those molecules enter your cochlea and then go through your brain and then get to the amygdala that you hear a piece of music and you start to cry, or you see a work of art, and you think about it for a month afterwards, and you interpret it in many different ways. And all of the other things, that space that I was talking about earlier, the human and ecological resiliency, that is the base. But the challenge that you should rise to is reach my amyg amygdala, find my amygdala, make me, make me feel something deeply. And that's what we do as designers that elevate us above kind of mere engineering. So it's a tall order and I can't say that we do it every time, but we strive towards it. And I think to have big goals is really important. So that space of resilience what, what we do is something we, I love complexity, I hate simplicity. I hate something that you can explain in one sentence. We've done three competitions in our 25, 26 years of practice, and we've only won one. <laughs> um, because competitions are difficult. You can't be complex in competitions. You have to guess a lot of things. And we're interested in embedding ourselves. So it's this combination of resiliency and kind of innovation. Innovation is another horrible word that's really overused. But let's say something new, something new. So this is the one competition that we won. I'm going to start off on a high note. Um, this is in Seoul, Korea. And it's the Chungae River, and we were part of a very large team, but we did win the competition for the source point of the river. Seoul is a really dense city. It's got 22 million people. It's eight times denser than New York City. Um, and it doesn't mean, like, I think it was like 16,700 people are packed into like one kilometer. But that but, uh, doesn't mean that they're all standing like this. It, it, that, these Asian cities are really dense at multiple levels, right? So um, our site, you can see the source point is at that yellow cross. 
and it's a seven mile river that it's a project of revealing and uncovering and connecting. So um, I'm not going to go through the whole history, but you can see that there are all these different neighborhoods that are flanking this riverway. And all of these yellow arrows that you see are bridges that um, were part of the master plan to reconnect the city, stitch the city back together. And why did we need to do that? It's because uh, for hundreds of years, surficial sludge and urban effluence was pouring into this river. And by the early 20th century, it had become a real hazard, um, health hazard. So uh, what they did in the late 1960s was basically cover it with a highway. So we'll, what was once a natural amenity, a historic amenity, the reason why Seoul was situated, the first general, I guess, who came there said, this is a natural amenity. Let's build a city around this. Um, they covered it and divided the city. So you can see this is the highway on the left. Um, and on the right is actually uh, the transformation and uncovering of the project. I think this is a video, so let's see. So to us in America, this may seem like a small kind of gesture. But if you've been to any Asian city, you know this is a big kind of green corridor as an investment um, which has transformed the city ecologically. It has um, done all of the things that I just talked about, expanded the zone of resiliency. And there are multiple levels. These are the bridges that actually connect neighborhoods, which was once divided by highways. And it is the, the more interesting the project the more unexpected the results for us as designers. And that's slowly becoming my gauge, is that the more people use our projects in ways that we had not planned, because we all do those bubble um, programming diagrams, but you just don't know what people are going to do. And this has become an urban beach. You know, we have created these um, kind of sloped stone elements that slope down into the water as a very simple gesture, which is to bring people closer to the water. The other element of the project, which um, I guess I'll show it in a minute, the project has Im immense, this is the first project I worked on where I understand landscape has real political impact. It has the ability to really transform the social um, network and social environment of a city. And it also has a very powerful ability to be both environmentally um, resilient and that in, in turn then transforms air quality, um, reduces asthma rates in the city, and round and round it goes. It is a place where the natural world and natural systems are revealed, but I want to be very clear, we are not creating nature here. This is not nature, and any project that generally is in the city is not. And so very early on um, in our work, I felt that in order to communicate to a larger audience about what, um, what we're trying to achieve here, it's very important not to pretend like Mother Nature came and, and just healed everything. I think it is very important for people to understand that these are systems that are in place and they are human made. So um, every project I'm gonna to show today is gonna to show this kind of transformation, the kind of toughness that a project has to have in order to be successful. So this is, um, one of the projects on the right is an image of, they had huge flooding um, a few weeks ago, but essentially the grades of this kind of um, lowered greenway um, becomes a detention basin and slowly releases water um, and basically creates a more resilient downtown. 
But you can see that very, very quickly it can fill up. And then um, the very next day it sort of gets released. And again, it's used as, as a place of gathering. There's always a historical or cultural component when you are working in the city. Um, there, and sites, they talk to you. And if you listen, you can understand their complexity. This site, um, it was uh, conceived of as a place where um, when the two Koreas re would reunite, they would celebrate it here. And that was the charge of the competition. And at that time, the two countries had marched together in the Olympics. It was a very hopeful time that the two countries would come together. And um, we were able at that time, there are nine provinces in the two countries. And um, we had the nine provinces donate all of the granite for this project. So there are nine source points for the project. And each source point is granite from each of the provinces. So this is where we are. This is, there's a kind of cultural engagement. There is an ecological piece. And then there's a way in which just hang out, right? Um, millions of people come here. The last time I was there, it's a place where if you're going to work from one side of the river to the other, you actually choose to go down because it's cooler down there during the summer. It's nicer to walk the river and then go back up, which I would have never predicted. Um, it becomes a kind of amenity during the pandemic, a place where kids can boogie board, a place for art. And one of the concepts of the master plan is at the source point, because of the volume of water, it is more architectural, it is more cultural. And as you move further down the Seven Mile River corridor, it becomes more and more green, more and more um, uh, ecological. And so this is the Chang'e River in the middle. And this was a couple years ago. You may have read it in the paper when the South Korean president was in some hot water for getting advice from, you know, and one can't point their finger at their country and not look at our own, but getting advice from, from shamans or something like this. And, but I show this picture because this is the, one of the most important things in terms of social justice that civic landscapes, public landscapes do, is they provide a place for everyone to have a voice. Architecture doesn't generally do that. You can lock the doors. But this is the place where they called it the Million Person March, where people came out and they spoke their voice as a collective. There's something about our studio where we are working in opposite, oppositions, opposites. And it's a challenge that I think um, some people in the back, there's some chairs here. You should welcome to come forward. Um, this is at the Chicago Botanic Garden um, in Illinois. And so uh, this was shortly after we finished the Chang'e River. But I wanted to show this project as another resiliency project to show that resiliency is a big room. It has that every client asks um, different questions. If you've never been to the Chicago Botanic Garden, you should go visit it because it is, it is just one of the most amazing places I've been to. Um, we started off by looking at different sites. Um, they knew they wanted a new garden. They weren't sure where it would be. And they weren't sure what the programming of it would be. And so when we started the project, um, we kind of, through our dialogue, started to say, does the botanic garden of the future become a place more of learning? Does it become a place where young people, younger than me, but young people who are constantly staring at their phone, are really kind of willed to engage the natural world. And so what we did was um, there, there's, uh, you can see in that hatch, 
start to think about a learning campus for, the natu for nature, for the environment, that is public. So it's outside of the gates of where you pay your ticket. Um, and it is a place that utilizes the basic elements of the landscape, earth, water, I want to say fire now, <laughs> now, earth, water, stone, and this discovery of the natural world. So you can see that um, within the watershed, this is, this is where we're located, they experience immense flash floods. Like within minutes, it becomes like this. The image is on the right. Um, and so they wanted to start to think about the landscape as a place, this new landscape as a place that actually holds water and slowly releases it, similar to Chunggye Chun. Occasionally, I'm going to show you some of our process uh, models and three-dimensional kind of things that we make. We, as an office, we, we use every tool that there is. Sometimes we go to the grocery store to find things. Um, we, I think making things by hand is such a sensual act. It's not the same as doing a laser cut model that you've already predetermined what all the shapes are going to be. There's something about us working together and pressing our thumb against this clay that makes us a much more collaborative tool. Every design we do, we probably do 100 iterations in our office. We are very lucky that we have, it is an ethos of our office, it is built into our contracts that we do it again and again. And I think that comes from being a pianist. That's what you do, hours every day, again and again, right? Um, so our site is way up here. I'm too short to point to it, but up here. And you can see this is a flash flood condition. It happens very, very quickly. And our site is part of the kind of resiliency language. So these mounds that you see here are part of the tools that hold this, um, the, the kind of fluctuation of water in this landscape. And so you can see this little stream, which is fed by um, the lake adjacent. And this whole area actually fills up with water and then is slowly released. And so in this project, we utilized landform as a play element, as a way of retaining stormwater, and as a way of, um, we talked a lot about in the Midwest, there's a whole heritage of Native, Native American mounds. And to start to kind of build on that heritage and contribute to that language that someday, hopefully this isn't true, but someday if we don't take care of ourselves and our planet, people will come and they'll see these mounds and they'll say, what were these things? And then little will they know that these were actually, well, there are many things, right? Um, and that everything that we were designing as play elements are actually found on site. We did not import anything. Cut and fill were equalized. Those of you who are taking a grading class, it, in reality, it's doable. But this is um, a, a moment of flooding, and this is a play area that we utilize some of the trees that were taken down in the regrading process with the assumption that in five to six years that, that these um, these will start to dissolve. And, um, you know, that's what's so wonderful about working with a botanic garden is they, they believe that people should get splinters. No, I was going to say get splinters in their fingers, but that there isn't a fear of, of, of the engaging the natural world. That, that um, this is a side thing, but I feel like I should say it, which is, when we think about play and we think about um, children, I don't think we think about it enough. And it is so impactful. Like I wonder, some sociologist in about five to 10 years is gonna do a study 
And some of you may be in that study because many of the playgrounds you've grown up with is from a catalog. And if you grew up in Houston, you grew up in Boston, you grew up in Seoul, you may have played with the same playground equipment. And I think that is going to show up because play is a way of learning when your brain is, is evolving and, and growing. And so that's a whole other lecture. But, but this is something that we want to do is I was thinking about when we were talking, we were thinking about not just like, what do you do while you're there? But I was thinking about when I go to the beach, um, maybe the most poetic piece of it is when I come home and there's still sand in my shoe. So you see these kids, you know, they pick up a seed and they kind of slide it into their pocket and then they take it home and they put it on their, that's what we want. That's what we want for people to do. Um, so we, when we get to the granular, which I won't get into today, we are selecting plants that provide that kind of level of richness. This um, uh, Chicago Botanic Garden is a little bit outside of Chicago, and we worked closely with them to try to create an interface to integrate um, students who are underprivileged, who don't even have a tree on their, in their neighborhood, to spend uh, a part of their summer here. And so this is you know, a kind of discovery program that evolved from the making of this educational garden. And then this is the art. Like what exactly, how exactly? There's nothing about all the parameters of the ecological, um, the volume that we're trying to collect that tells us what, what is the kind of sh uh, the experience that we're trying to create. So we have some amphitheaters in the back, but there's a kind of densification of the mounds towards the west. And you know, even when I was a student, when I was sitting in your shoes, um, I'm going to get myself into trouble. And professors would say, well, why, why is this red? And I wish I was me back then, because you, there's no answer to that question. There is a portion of what we do as landscape architects that just has to be right. And you have to trust yourself as creative people and individuals to make, make those decisions. So for us, this was right. Um, in fact, it wasn't right. Our drawings weren't right because we were on site and we're like, higher, higher, higher. It just felt like, oh, let's make it really, like we're in a botanic garden, you can do a two to one slope here, so let's do it. So um, whenever we work somewhere, what I realized when I did this for this lecture is everywhere we work is a majority minority environment. And I don't know if, I think it might be the cart before the horse, but it's, um, we are hired in places where we may represent points of view. But I think in the future, any of you who are working in the city should pay attention to this because every place is different. Um, Chicago uh, is a place that's been very good to us. We love Chicago. I love that city. Um, we, as I said, we did our first pediatric hospital there. And the demographics of children, and ch uh, pediatrics is um, until age 27, so <laughs> many of you are still um, in the pediatric demographic. Um, but Chicago is very interesting. It's like a third, a third, and a third, right? The, the patients that are being treated. Um, so this is a very different project. It's not, um, and I feel like this is something that we like to do in our studios to flex our muscles um, in many different ways. So we got a call. This is a completely interior setting. And we were asked to participate in this. They were doing a, 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 an assessment at that time. Do we spend $9.5 million on, a, on two MRI machines in this space? or do we build a garden on the 11th floor? And I thought, oh my god, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Can you do both? Um, 
But, and they did do both, um, because um, there are a lot of people who write checks who really believe that integrating or injecting gardens into these clinical environments are worth 10, 15, 20 million dollars. So it's, we're lucky that people want to participate in that. This is a multi-level garden. Um, this is one of the most controversial parts of this project. When you go through a project, you never know what's going to make somebody uncomfortable. And this, um, we had the whole thing was glass before. And uh, so I went to Chicago maybe four or five times, and there were discussions about, well, so this is a glass floor in the gardens below. And so young girls with skirts on going across the glass and people underneath. And I thought, for God's sakes, we can frost the glass. <laughs> but these are part of the discussions we have. And so we, you know, we ended up actually utilizing wood. Um, and I will talk about that in a minute. But this is somebody who, this is a space that's completely enclosed for uh, the most vulnerable populations in the hospital who cannot um, and we all understand this now, right, after living through COVID, what it's like to be so vulnerable that you can't sit next to somebody. There's some people, some, there's some stories, and landscapes are about people's stories. Um, here of, I was born, I was rushed over to Lurie Children's Hospital and had two heart surgeries in a row. And... You know, I'm in fifth grade now, and I've, I've, I lived in the hospital for four months without ever going outside. These are the stories we hear. And so we created a room, which is something that you reserve, and you can look down into the activity. You can look out into the activity. So voices unheard, right? Um, but the brain is such an amazing thing. You know, there's a lot of research out there now which tells us that these uh, spaces that we design within three to five minutes, when designed um, within parameters that we understand, um, it normalizes much of our brain function, the electrical movement through our brain, um, our blood pressure. There is a, enough data out there now that we just finished a project for Boston Children's Hospital where they, they um, have eight gardens in their new um, building. So we always do this, and I just wanted to show this, trying to think, before we even draw and plan, we start to think, what is the multi-sensory experience and where does that happen in the space? It makes sense to us, may not make sense to you, but maybe that doesn't matter because we don't share this with other people. We just, well, I'm sharing with you today, but um, we're, we just do things to understand things more deeply. And so there was something about the kind of um, meander that, that, has, that really shaped the project. And then, of course, this is your um, programming diagram and an axon. And so ultimately, um, there are all these parameters of designing inside. You cannot use very many plants because they are, um, the organic material is problematic for people's respiratory systems. And we did not want to gate this off and make it so, such that people, you know, if you have such, such, and such, you cannot enter this garden. So we had to come up with ways, and then the standard materials of like stone and concrete are somewhat problematic because they absorb germs and they release them. And so we found this material, which is uh, recycled resin. It's a custom cast recycled resin. And this is one of the sketches that I did with pastels. Doesn't have a scale. It's just an idea of kind of an overlapping embrace of some sort. You know, it's a kind of idea rather than. And then you can see in um, Rhino, we started kind of building the, the kind of layering of that. Um, and so you can see, again, a physical model that's made to the right. And so you, there were all these different pieces, and we were sitting around a table, kind of interlocking them and trying to see what makes sense. And this is the project. I mean, it makes it, so, it seem so easy, right? <laughs> like, show the model, and then voila. 
Um, but you can see there, you know, details matter. I, I really love just the challenge of the detail. Like, what is, how does the cap on this work, you know, does it matter? Yes, it matters. Um, and I think kind of exercising that muscle, I think, is really important to do. So we've embedded some technology in, into these walls because, um, you know, we just don't want these patients to touch anything. I mean, we, we understand that now, right, after the way we've lived over the last two and a half years. So everything is motion sensors coming from the ceiling and kind of technology that shows up um, in, in the walls themselves. You can see this marble wall. Um, this is actually a fountain. We had a fountain there, and um, there, there was a case of Legionnaire's disease that came up um, in Houston, Texas, and so, they, and so we got to remove it. And so we started thinking about, well, how can we create the sound? Because that's the most powerful thing about water. And so we found these marbles, and we used one of those glycerin um, kind of agitators. I, I'm sure you've seen them. They're, like, they're in these pl uh, plexiglass containers and in hospitals everywhere, and they're just water that shoots up. And what happens is they agitate the marble so they f sound like something tidal. Like um, I live uh, in Rockport, which is in the North Shore, and you, I hear the same sound when they, it pulls the gravel in and out from, um, from the shore. So we must have spent months just trying to find this. Maybe that's what it is. We're trying to find some idea, some, some way of thinking about things. And um, so one thing, this is kind of connected to the Chungay River where there's the materiality isn't just something you, you spec and it shows up in a, in a crate. But we want material, materials that have a kind of resonance to it. So um, we had a series of seating elements that we just kept holding off. We weren't sure what we wanted to do with them. And I got a call at around 11 o'clock one night from um, an urban arborist in Chicago. Um, he, that's him right here. And that's his son right there to the left. And all the young women in our office always wanted to go on field trips to meet him because um, he was really buff. Um, but. Uh, Bruce called me at around 11 and said, oh, McYoung, you know, five uh, trees that were planted by Frederick Law Olmsted during the last, during the Columbian Exposition, 1897 maybe? I'm on, I'm on tape too. Um, and do you want it? And I thought, yes. I was thinking about that child who said, I did not leave the hospital for six months please bring a piece of Chicago into the garden for me. And I couldn't figure out, like, is it a sign? You know, like, what do we do? And this is a piece of Chicago. It's a piece of Chicago history. We shared it with other institutions in Chicago, but this is essentially. And then, you know, there's always an and then. We don't just accept it and then just bring it down. We said, OK, um, what if we make this an interactive kind of sculptural bench? And so we had this idea of casting kids' hands. And you'll see it in a second. There are like these cast bronze hands. So when a child puts their hand on, on these kind of sensors, there's sound that emerges from the log. But this is an interesting story, is that you never know when you do these interactive. This is what I call community engagement, right? Um, we said, oh, let's, let's do it for two days so we give a lot of um, opportunity for patients to come. And I had this theory. So theory is beautiful until it gets put into practice. And this theory is like, for the first three hours, we're going to do like uh, zero to six months, or zero to one year. And then, uh, you know, so on and so forth till we get to teen. So we have all these different size hands. And this is a, a product where you put your hand in and you hold it in there for three to five minutes. And it captures right, like a real detail of your kind of thumbprint and everything. Um, and so we started on the first day, and these, these parents were so aggressive. <laughs> They were like, you are going to get your hand in that garden if it kills me. And so, no, they weren't like that. 
Um, but they brought in these young uh, kids who were in these carts, you know, and they had IVs and they were smiling and laughing and we would kind of play with them and they would put their hands in this and it's this cold, viscous liquid and they would just start crying. <laughs> and it was just so awful and I had to tell, it was like I was Mr. Rogers because there was a line of all these carts waiting for their kids to get their hand imprinted and I had to tell them, your kid has to be up to sit still for three minutes. Um, so these are two kids who are over one years old and they are watching SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> so, you know, the little decisions that I love to think about, which is when you cast somebody's hand and you make a cast of that, it's actually a relief. And so when we thought about it, we said, we should make a cast of the cast because we want the hand to go, so you can see it's inset. Um, you can see that for every handprint that we made, I don't know if you can see it, we then put the, the child's name, the patient's name, and their age. So there, was, there are all these like paper hands we have as well. I just love this part of design. I think it's, a, it's really, and then, you know, when you put your hand in, we said, what if it's sounds of water but it's like cultural sounds of water, not natural sounds of water. Not like you go to a store and buy one of those noise machines to help you sleep. So we pick things like gurgle and slurp and things like that. So you put your hand in and you can hear it, just to be playful. And I, I think design has to be effective without your standing there and explaining it. If I ever taught a studio again, I would never let anyone present their project. <laughs> You'll never let me come here, but I, I think that the design has to speak for itself. You cannot give a set of instructions because that's not the way it works. So when, it was a huge relief when these kids started putting their hands on the, because we put so much effort into it. And then this is the view from the Prentice Women's Hospital, all the beds look out onto this garden. So it's a kind of icon as well. Um, I want to talk about uh, two projects that we're working on now that's in progress. Our work has gotten larger and larger, um, but it remains the same. The complexity, that space I talked about, we still inhabit it. We just have more people working with us, and I work longer hours. Um, Wellesley College, was a, which is in Wellesley, Massachusetts, we were hired last year to do a 47-acre Science Hill master plan for them. Uh, Wellesley College is 100% women. I, I saw a statistic where it said 99.2%. I thought, oh my God, it's 0.8% men? <laughs> but I think that was incorrect. Um, it's almost 40% LGBTQ. Um, and it's got a nice mix of demographics. Um, it is a place that has a very deep history. Um, the campus was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, and I am the first woman landscape architect to work on that since then. So this woman's college, it took them hundreds of years to allow, and not only that, a woman of color, my God. <laughs> no, they've been wonderful. And, but they shared some historical photos it, even if they were wearing long dresses and kind of taking care of their hair and things, they were still women who thought deeply. I mean, you can see in these pictures, uh, they're probably thinking, oh, it's such a pain that I have to wear the skirt. You know, I wish I could just like wear boots and a pair of pants. But this project, again, is about resiliency and water. You can see that historically, it was a place that, um, that really had, uh, this part of the campus has a lot of different kinds of um, water systems. This one in particular, though, is very strange. If you ever go to Wellesley, you'll see it. It is actually fed, it's a fountain, and it looks completely natural. 
And so it's fed by city water. And last year, the city started charging them for the water. So that's one of the reasons why we were hired is because you know, it's part of the identity of the campus, and now they can't afford it. Um, because they were using so much water for this that like people in town, there were droughts, and there wasn't enough water for people to like shower and stuff. So, um, so this is the 47 acres within the larger campus. We've been so fortunate to work in these incredibly beautiful places. Wellesley campus is not only one of the most beautiful campuses, it is also one of the places that's most experimental with um, its uh, um, architectural uh, additions. Right? It has some of the greatest works of architecture in the Boston area. So a lot of people do pilgrimages there for that. So our, our site is kind of a wedge in here, and that's the Science Hill um, building. And there's an addition, be sorry, an addition being added to it. So just a very beautiful, and this pond is being fed by that artificial stream. But there's a diversity of different kinds of stormwater and wetland conditions that, um, let me see if this is it, that, um, and the, the site itself has many different watersheds. So we kind of spent a lot of time really listening to the site, understanding the site, and working with our civil engineering team to understand that. But in the end, this is kind of the diagram we try to find, is what is water doing on the site? And you can see all these little jelly bean shapes. It's very disconnected. You don't really realize it till we did the analysis. There's many different kinds of water elements, drainage conditions. There's a lot of erosion on the site. And so we started with a condition like this. And we strove towards something like this. Which just as a diagram is like this idea that can we link this whole thing together into a kind of, into a single system, a single ecological system, but also a kind of singular um, experience for people. So you can see there's, um, it's not just blue, but it's green as well because this is also an arboretum. So thinking about how the, the kind of stream system can also hold a new typology of vegetation for the arboretum. So this is an aerial just showing you that ring and that resiliency gateway. And in these larger projects that I'm talking about, I'm not going to explain everything about it. Um, but just to kind of share what I mean by, it's kind of like a fractal process where you look at things at multiple scales at the same time. So it's not just understanding human and ecological resiliency, but it's also understanding the kind of experience of the touch versus the experience of standing at you know, 40,000 square feet at the same time. So um, you know, while we're thinking about the ecological um, linking the kind of resiliency system, we're also thinking about all the different areas where we could create new outdoor classrooms for the college. So everything you see in blue is um, different kinds of learning opportunities that we outline. So they're kind of overlaid maps. And then again, there's a kind of condition of kind of bringing, integrating um, horticultural, um, new horticultural learning environments like fungiculture and pollinator gardens and test gardens. and and kind of being true to those photos that um, I showed up front of, of these students really immersing themselves in the natural world and, and providing opportunities to do so. So this is um, the Paramecium Pond, and it is fed um, artificially by, uh, by a fountain, basically, by potable water. So part of our charge um, so there were two charges, two big things we did. One is within the ring, we moved all of the vehicular parking, all the impervious surfaces outside of the ring. And the other was that we took, we kind of tried to create a rhythm based on both what the civil engineering required, but also based on what, what kind of learning we want on this campus. So this is the Paramecium Pond, and we basically kind of allowed for it um, because it was uh, basically a fountain before. 
um, and it used potable water, it always stayed at around the same level. And so we, we have created something as well as like seating areas and things that start to act as um, indicators of the level of the water and allow for you to kind of enter and exit. Um, so similar to the Chang'e Seoul River, these kind of, these elements immerse in the water when there's a flood and then kind of dissipate. So I want to show this to you just to show our street creds. To, these aren't just pretty pictures. But um, how did we link things that were not linked? One is to look at um, you know, where water is being collected and where it's coming from. And so um, Center Street is at the top. So one of the things we're doing is we're actually drawing all of the water um, that, that's coming from that street, creating these um, singular detention ponds, and then connecting what they call the silver thread, which is this black line. So we're doing multiple things. We're creating a kind of cohesive element. And then we're also kind of reaching out to the town and actually cleansing um, the system. And so within that, this is one of the detention systems. Um, the piece that we're actually building phase one of now is this piece. And it's like, this is the science building. And we call this the science walk. And they wanted a kind of more a larger um, outdoor classroom area with lots of other programming that I won't talk about today. But it's a very steep incline. And uh, to the east, so to the right, is, is a, a, a condition of a, a very steep slope without much understory, so a lot of erosion. So part of our charge was to start to think about that. Concurrently, as we were working on this, we were thinking about um, outdoor classrooms. What, what does that mean in, in this setting? And we met with all these professors. And, and so already, they, so this is the contemporary version of that first image that I showed you, right? Um, so finally, they're wearing pants. <laughs> um, but you know, the geology professor said, could you start to um, integrate kind of different forms of geology into the landscape? And we could actually use the landscape as a tool for learning. So this is what we call the kind of uh, resiliency ring, which is a series of stepped conditions, which is made out of stone and wood. And these are all, what is it, igneous? I've forgotten the other two. Can someone help me? What are the sedimentary? What's the third one? That's right. OK. So we, we kind of, the concept is that there are all these slabs and that when it rains, this becomes a detention basin and holds water. And then after the rain, it becomes an outdoor classroom. So I've now shown you three different ways to hold water and release it in three very different contexts. And this is the room that I'm talking about. This is a place of learning. It's hopefully a place of beauty. It's a place that functions to um, relieve uh, erosion. Um, and it, it creates an interconnected system. It, do, it no longer wastes water. <laughs> and so it does all those things. So could you win a competition saying those things? Probably not. But this is what I think that, that space um, should entail. OK, last project. Um, we are working currently with a Ford Motor Company on a 14-acre uh, park in downtown Detroit. It is, Detroit is majority minority and um, a really amazing city. Um, so this is a historic train station that um, in the early 20th century was built and um, you know, it was a hub and a hub of innovation. It was a place of transportation and and laid fallow for many decades. And Ford, the Ford Motor Company, purchased this and actually has transformed, has, has invested a billion dollars in kind of um, transforming this into. Um, I think part of some of their. Um, 
they're, they're consolidating their staff to this location, but they're also tr trying to create a neighborhood center. So you can see in the background, let me see, that this was a place where, you know, it was a place of industry. It's an amazing site. It's 11 acres of train tracks elevated above grade. Um, and so below grade is where all the passenger entry was. And right now it's, you know, it's um, in dis disrepair. So we started by just looking at the city at large because 14 acres in Detroit is a lot of space. You know, we don't, we wanted to understand what is this, what is this, um, this site? And the site is in that yellow, orange dotted line. And what we found is that there are two neighborhoods. There's Mexican Town and Cork Town. Mexican Town is mostly Hispanic and Cork Town is mostly white and um, younger families. And, and they are completely divided by these elevated train tracks, both in terms of grade, but also I think in terms of how the city works. And so one of the things we really wanted to do was to make this park a place where the two communities could come together and mix. Um, this, we do this in every project. They didn't want to show it for every project, but just wanted to show you what we look at each time and how it's not just ecological, but it also has a kind of um, a human resiliency piece to it. So they have, our site is in this pink circle, and it's this idea, uh, you know, we know we're in a flood zone, and so it, you can see um, in Detroit they have a lot of issues with flooding. So that was one of the primary kind of guidelines that we worked with. We looked at noise pollution and air pollution, as we did with Chungay. And um, there's a whole set of goals we developed up front. Some of it has to do with technology. And one of the things the Ford Motor Company wanted to do with the site in their civic spaces is to kind of exhibit the newest technology. So we are um, integrating things like uh, the latest smart lighting system so that they're, so like night lighting isn't an on off switch, but it is something that is interactive and kind of fades when there are no people there and then kind of brightens when people engage. Smart traffic, frictionless charging, all these things are going to be part of this campus. But one thing that we found when I first started the project, I thought, oh, is this going to be like a Blade Runner with all these things flying around and stuff? And, and what, like, um, we're developing this trough where food actually is going to get, like, you order something on your phone and it's going to come into the garden and you pick it up. Um, it's the technology makes things more responsive and more invisible. Not, not, uh, not like Blade Runner, at least not for us. So, what you can see is that with those 550 new trees, you also bring about health and well-being. I'm not going to read through this, but you, we all know that um, there are parts of Detroit that really can, that really will benefit from, and it's something that the community has asked for, which is how can we create a place that brings, a, it's, it's sort of like the same questions that they ask when we go to a hospital. It's how can we make this? And this is more and more what we're hearing um, on campuses, um, in public parks, in children's playgrounds, after the pandemic. Not, we're not done, but. Um, so these are the resonances of materials that I've talked about in the other projects. We are retaining all of the 7,500 linear feet of train tracks. We're t retaining the columns that hold up the train tracks, and the building and the detailing of early 20th century, um, these kind of train tracks, you can see, I don't know if you can see that, but there's this really ornate um, limestone that we're using throughout the project. We're also kind of engaging the community and building um, a, a pretty large Miyawaki forest here. Um, so working with elementary school kids to kind of they're giving, Ford is giving a piece of this back to the community to watch this kind of ecological forest grow. And boy, they're amazing kids. 
<laughs> um, so this just shows you the kind of the way in which the infrastructure, some of it which is historic, starts to, we're uncovering again. We're uncovering some of the, the, um, the structure up above to create civic spaces. But this is the space where we're saying that these two communities could come together and engage. And you can see there's a lot of technology that, um, that allows for us to do what we do today. And just an axonometric. So we, you know, we work in many different, with many different technologies, but Rhino is a very important part of how we study space. It's not a great tool to understand things holistically. That's been my experience. And just an aerial with the train station and the plaza. So there, there's actually a central kind of native biodiverse garden in the center flanked by two civic spaces. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to, I'm not going to go through the whole project, but I wanted to talk about some of the things that were important in this. One of the things that was important was having this large plaza. I always worry when no one is there, what does it do? And how can we use technology to create flexibility in civic spaces? And so one of the things we're doing is we have this um, garden um, which is in the center. And essentially, we're putting them on the tracks. And they're actually kind of, if you've ever seen, um, we showed this at our interview, the, those um, soccer fields that turn into a football field that like turned into an ice rink. We just showed the things opening and closing. We thought, wouldn't that be fun to do here? So that's kind of what we're doing here is this, these things will be automated and they'll open and close. Um, this will be the everyday. And then when you have an event, Ford is exhibiting their latest electric vehicle. Um, there, there's a number of tech companies. There's an Albert Kahn building on this campus, and that, that's been filled with a lot of tech companies. I wanted to end with a few details, because we saw the big picture. But concurrently, we're also thinking about, so we have this idea of having this kind of elevated experience. You can see. Um, Detroit proper and uh, the river from here so that you come up in this elevator and um, you have this uh, walkway that's one level up above the, the train tracks. And what we came up with was the use of these kind of terracotta um, members that are rails. That ha there are two triangles. The left is a blue and the right is another color, maybe red. And so that when you enter the, the park, it may all look like one color. And then as you move around, we're not sure if it should be like, bam, turns red, or if it should be like this gradual thing. We're making some videos right now. And these are cardboard models that, in fact, I think Yu Fei helped to make, who's a recent grad. Um, and we just, we put them outside. We found this highway structure. We're trying to find the like place to put them. Are they big enough? Are they, and we, I kept saying, it's not big enough. It's going to get lost. But what we learned by building five different size mock-ups is it wants to be really slender. Because you want that fabric of color. You don't want to see each individual piece. So, so that's kind of the garden framed by the lookout. We have these garden rooms that are made of the, uh, like brick, kind of uh, inspired by the building. But within those garden rooms are embedded different kinds of technology. So we're working with IBI. And we're talking, we're having conversations about in the future, people will still work outside, but maybe your avatar will join the meeting. And so we are designing these things for technology that doesn't exist today, but maybe in the future, so that you can easily integrate them. And the last piece is the gateway, the front gateway, which we're calling the resiliency gateway. And it is um, based on the kind of volume of water that we're collecting. 
So I wanted to show, you know, this is our office, and this is us. I don't think there are any, no. Um, and so sometimes it's faster and more effective to build a cardboard model. <laughs> so we kept building these 3D models, and I was like, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And we, once we built this, and even the client understood this better, like how does the road cross the resiliency gateway, all of these things. And so you can see, you know, there are different options that we're like trying to cut pieces and place them down. Use all of your tools. Just because it's old fashioned doesn't mean it's bad. So this is a 3D model that we, we've built. And just understanding that everything below this is, is a technological, is, is infrastructure. It's not natural. And so what we wanted to do was create this kind of ring which holds most of the water and then releases it slowly. And there's just like a, a sequence of planting as you're going up. So we're trying to balance cut and fill again on the site. And utilizing a planting strategy across the site of patch ecologies that are based in Illinois in kind of this region. And so you can see where this is where the resiliency gateway is right here. And we, we've placed the emergent marsh, which is at the lowest point of the site. So some views. And what we really got excited about is that you can actually see the reflection of the train station in the kind of resiliency gateway. Um, someone, Brian Cho, who you just saw in my office, is like, I bet you can see the, the uh, reflection in the, in the uh, water. I was like, that's not going to happen. I don't know if it's true, but this is what the rhino model told us. <laughs> And so once we built the resiliency ring, which you see in that pink foreground, um, we started thinking, wouldn't it be nice when you stand there that there are different, um, there are different uh, phases of water? So the first is a pool of water. The middle is a mist ring. And then this is a kind of interactive light piece. So when you stand there, you see all three together. So the mist ring sits behind and is something that you walk through. And then this is, the, this is that um, light, interactive light element. So when you're up above, you actually can move these lights, and it moves the lights down below. And you may think, God, that's complicated. Like, why do you need so much stuff? But it's 14 acres. I think, I think it's, it's OK, right? I think, and so this is a Jess Hamilton from our office sitting on one of these reclaimed stone pieces. You know, it's, this project is almost too easy because there's so much great stuff on the site. But part of our charge is to use as much uh, upcycled material from the site. And so from that upper platform where we have these kind of rotating or interactive light pieces, we're going to float those found stone pieces, those benches at the upper level. So you can see everything coming together. There are the terracotta frame. There's the, um, the, this is the flooring that, I don't have time for that, but it's a separate story. But we have, I think it's cohesive, but it's got a lot of, lot of ideas. That's what design is. That's what design is. So this is that view from the resiliency gateway. You have that first ring here. You have the mist that draws you further into the site. And then you see the sparkle of light from that upper level. And sometimes you may even see it move when people are interacting with it. And so what is it that draws you into the site? It's this, right? It's design. And so that front area is that resiliency gateway. So you know, I think in, in closing, I just want to say, you know, it's, it's um, being a landscape architect is like so amazing today. You guys are so lucky because it is, um, people understand now how important it is. Before the pandemic, you know, when you were afraid or there was something coming that was um, dangerous, you would go inside and you'd shut the doors and lock, close the windows. But during the pandemic, you would go outside, right? The streets, um, the parking, parking on the streets became 
places where people would eat. You know, the, the landscape became the place of refuge. And I think for us as a studio, as a kind of, as an ethical point of view, it became a, a time when everyone understood that human health, um, humanity, and the natural world are one, right? That we are reliant on each other. And I would charge all of you as current and future landscape architects, this is your charge. So I'd say don't stop when you've got your volumes of storm water, but there's a lot of creativity beyond that. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yes. Right. You know, I'm going to use an analogy. We just had our office party, and um, my father was telling me a story that when I, um, when I was a baby and my parents took me back to South Korea to introduce me to my grandmother, my father brought me down in his arms, and she was shocked, shocked that a man would be doing woman's work. It's a long time ago, but, and when I was at the office party, I saw like men kind of embracing the role of caregiver. And I think that we all have that in us. We all want to do many things. We don't want to stay inside one box. I think we're always happier when we have the capacity to kind of Stand, um, there's a quote by Emily Dickinson that says, my business is circumference. And it's such a beautiful quote. Um, I think it's this idea of being able to, in, in, in ecology, that's the richest, the ecotone, right? That's the richest place. So I would say it's not really about, like, how do people feel about uh, overlapping into one person's territory or another, but it's really about inhabiting the ecotone, right? It's a, Everybody wants to be in that rich place where, like, all this activity is happening. So um, I'd say, uh, like, this, this morning I was in New York presenting for a project at New York Presbyterian. And um, it's a different environment now. It's so exciting that there's a kind of give and take uh, that didn't exist when I started practicing. Um, but it is still nice to be the prime landscape architect. It is still nice to, to kind of collaborate with a team, but to have the realm of landscape. So you can see a lot of the projects we work on are projects where the client says, this landscape is so important, right? And so I, I think it's a lovely time, and I think things have really changed. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yay, technology. <laughs> so this is an inspiring question. I'm sure it's such an inspiring talk. Uh -huh. It's sort of nags at me so much. Um, you've been hearing a lot about working with water. And I'm always curious about how we designers, prime designers, uh, think about things yeah. when it comes to water. Because I know so many basic species of water and as we saw at the last series of trees washed up. So I'm just curious about how you tackle that. You know, I think there's an acceptance of um, a lack of perfection nowadays. I was going to show a residential project. We've done maybe three in our, in our career. But people have accepted that things are, that, that the natural world is about process. And so, 
but then it's also about planning for this. So it depends, it's context, right? So for example, at Chungi Chun, we wanted to put trees there, but they said they're gonna get ripped out after, and we'll be replacing them, and it's sort of against the nature of what this wants to be. So like at Central Park, they stopped allowing for, um, I'll call them protesters, but people to actually use the, the main lawn because it cost them a million dollars every time an event, a event happened. And so they cordoned it off. And so that's not what we want. We want it to be tough so that it can kind of manage that kind of activity, both water moving in and out, people moving in and out. So it's a discussion you have very early on. And it's something that you are very honest about, like trees will get uprooted. Um, I think for us, we, I never like to show a project where we show the photographer's photos. I think maybe a third of my presentation was photographers that we hired. We try to look on Instagram and see, well, how is this flooding? How is this doing? But it is, um, it's always a balance of like baking a place that people feel comfortable. It's not like co covered with dirt and that maintenance people have to come every time and like basically remove soil and, and trying to create you know, a place that has a capacity to kind of turn over very quickly. So lawn has turned out to be not such a great material for that. Um, I've found more and more, more and more difficult. You can see on the Ford project, there's no lawn. For a 14 acre park, that's unheard of, right? Um, so so it's, it's, there isn't a formula. It's, it's really about changing the thinking. We're seeing that in college campuses as well. You know, most college campuses have a lot of lawn. And we're working with a lot of uh, college campuses like Wellesley, where they're starting to kind of replace those with other things that aren't perfect, right? They don't look the same all year round. And it's just changing our thinking, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Hi, Megan. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I actually have a lovely opportunity of studying um, your Chung Bay Source Point project as one of my first case studies at the school. And one of the things that I remember about studying that was that you had an objective of bringing in this sort of reunification of South Korea, which is a highly sensitive uh, topic. And so I was wondering. How did you navigate that within the design, and also how did your cultural identity with um, the Korean immigrant play into the design? Wow, it's a. Uh, I feel like I'm in therapy. Um, no, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think we think of luck. Is something that just like dropped from the sky, sort of like on the plane I was in yesterday, where like some stuff was just like dropping from the venting system. We think of luck <laughs> as something that just drops down and falls in your lap, but it doesn't. It's a, it's a, like, it's a positioning. Luck is a positioning, and that was very lucky for us that we started that project at a moment when politically we could call quarries in North Korea and local administrators would help us find stone. It would not, we wouldn't be able to do that today. And so I can't take credit for that. I can only say, here's an idea. And it just happened to overlap with a very kind of, with a kind of political um, environment that was conducive to it. Um, I don't know if my Korean, I mean, we were shortlisted with West 8. They were the other finalists. If being Korean helped me, um, I get like wag the finger because I can't speak Korean. Um, I grew up at a time when, here in America, where teachers thought it was confusing for you to know multiple languages. This is sound ridiculous now, but my parents were so fearful. They were like, we're only speaking English at home from now on. It's like, OK, but I can't speak English. <laughs> How are we going to communicate? i got to go to the bathroom. Um, but I, is that on tape? <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, I actually, I do think that my Korean heritage 
um, you know, I grew up with Korean parents. I have a son who's 23, and I think I raised him in a way that has some echoes of there's, but I think that's what America is, right? It is bringing all these cultures together and kind of, um, and so I, I think I have an inherent understanding. But I did spend a lot of time when I was teaching at RISD, I got a number of grants to to spend some time in Korea and understand its heritage a little bit more deeply. So I have a feeling it might have helped. I, here's another aspect of luck, um, which is the reason why we were asked to join the competition was we had just published a book. And the book was in the Harvard bookstore. And at that time, the, uh, the vice prime minister was in Cambridge and was in the Harvard bookstore. And the binding was this like bright red color. And it says Mick Young Kim Design on the bind. And so it's a Korean name. And he just pulled it out and then realized I'm a landscape architect. And the next day came to our office. But I don't think we would have even been asked to join the competition. And so you make your own luck, but it is very lucky that these things happen, for sure. Great. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah. I'd like to mention there is a reception downstairs. Yeah. You should all take advantage of it. Yeah, I'm happy to chat with you guys. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>